Bonjour and welcome back to another episode, this time dealing with growing mediums. Yeah, you heard me right, growing mediums. So, we're going to be talking about some basic growing mediums because a lot of people have been asking me, so what is this white stuff or what is that spongy thing over there and you know, what do I use for this or you know, is this going to harm my plant or can I use this for blah 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 so this is exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to basically give you a run through of the basic growing mediums that one can find at your local uh, nursery or agricultural depot, right, that produces or provides people with uh, horticultural products used for growing plants. Okay, so let's go. Now, for the sake of continuity, what I've done earthquake is... Earthquake upgraded to 5.8 right, sorry, that's from 5.7. Location, Kakwaimo, Chile, class, moderate, depth, 12 kilometers, 20 minutes ago. For the sake of continuity, what I'm going to do is I've arranged them in two rows, okay? So in the front row, which is this one here, you have got all of your inorganic substances. In the back row, we've got some of the organic substances. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bit of a background and also uh, information as to how you can best utilize this when you are growing your plants. Okay, so I've got some notes with me because uh, I filmed this yesterday and I was very unhappy with like the quality and just the rambling. Um, so here we go. I'm going to use notes in order to actually really stratify my thoughts because there's a lot to be said about a lot of these mediums and um, I want to I want to give it to you in a way that um, makes it easy for you to actually utilize the information. Okay, so first and foremost, we've got some river sand. Okay, so again, remember this is inorganic. So what exactly is river sand? Let's take a look at it. Right, river sand is basically really fine uh, sand which comes from dun, 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 river systems. But you can also find river sand um, in other areas. So sometimes people would actually use sea sand and then give it a good wash and a wash and a wash and a wash. That is crap river sand. So be very careful if you're using sea sand unless you're germinating something like a coconut. Uh, or plants that are accustomed to growing on islands. Um, river sand can be made by crushing granite, right, or quartz, and, and that would actually give you this fine consistency. So now, river sand obviously comes in different grains. So you have larger grained river sand, which is coarse grain, and then you also have the finer stuff. Now, the ocean contains, or the beach sand contains, uh, chlorine also contains sodium which can be detrimental to plant growth so when you get river sand make sure that it is the river sand that you are able to use for horticultural purposes i.e. for uh, plant growing purposes okay so what exactly is river sand used for so the fundamental purpose is to improve drainage really that is what river sand is really used for so we all know that poorly poorly drained soil promotes root rot, right? So if your if if your your growing medium is something like clay or something really really stodgy and thick and it doesn't allow, it's not very permeable, doesn't allow water to go through it and holds water really too well. Um, those mediums do have their place, but uh, for the most part, a lot of plants find that very difficult to grow in, and it actually prevents the plant from being able to breathe and therefore causes the plant to die. Right, so that's river sand. Done. Let's go to um, silica sand. So silica sand, also known as pool filter sand, for those of you who did not know, this is actually silica sand. So again with silica sand you get coarse grained silica sand uh, you get varying degrees it depends on the company depends on on where you're getting it from so you can get really big chunky bits and then you can also get really small bits now 
Horticulturally speaking, how do we use it? What can it be used for? Again, very similar to river sand, uh, silica sand can be used to improve drainage in a particular growing medium that you're trying to put together. Um, it also very interestingly can be used for uh, promoting plant development in that silica sand will actually it'll actually be absorbed by the plant and it goes into the cellular structure of the plant so the roots the stems the leaves and it actually strengthens the plant so it also causes resistance against abi abiotic and biotic factors so ab abiotic is basically something like uh you know ambient temperature uh drought uh, harsh sun all of those kinds of things a biotic which means non-living and then biotic would be your pests and those kinds of things so it also makes it unpalatable uh, if a plant contains a lot of silica because uh, who wants to eat that right <laughs> um yeah so i'll do it right now and i'll do it for all the others that that where it's relevant as well so the one thing you have to remember about silica sand is that if it's in its liquid form you can provide it to plants and plants can actually uptake take that up and absorb it into their tissues and that sort of thing silica sand is basically toxic if you inhale it it's really really bad for you you could get something called silicosis i think I'll put the name up on screen, I think it's silly, something sort of tosis, you know, like it just, it's pretty bad for you, which is really what I'm getting at. Um, so just be careful of inhaling silica sand. Horticultural grade silica sand is generally okay because it is not a fine powder. The sand, not the powder. If it is powder, do not schnaff. If it is not powder, don't schnaff use it for plants okay okay good let's move to next growing medium the next one is perlite which is one of my favorites actually it's very pretty it reminds me of snow says the guy from africa who's never seen snow in his life um but nevertheless here you are so basically this here is a little granule of silicon let's see if i can zoom in on that for you all right there it is. Now watch this. It's powder. And this you definitely don't want to inhale. Even just dishing it out and working with silica sand, you, I mean with uh, with perlite, you don't want to inhale the stuff. You need to wear a mask. Uh, it can cause severe damage and I'll tell you why. So perlite is basically it is a, a naturally occurring rock which is found in the earth uh, and when you find it naturally it's really dense it's extremely like it, it it looks nothing like this really in other words so it's like finding corn and then whoever magically decided to put it into some oil and they turned into popcorn the same person <laughs> well, I bet they were related they figured out that if you took perlite in its natural state and you heated up heated it up to about 900 degrees celsius um it would pop and become these little balls right so it literally expands and they sometimes refer to it as expanded perlite now perlite really comes in different sizes you get horticultural grade you get building grade because it gets it has a multitude of different uses not just in horticulture it is fantastic stuff to work with um, it's just really not something you want to inhale so essentially how this happens is once it pops it causes all these little pockets inside <clears throat> excuse me it causes all these pockets inside and you can then obviously imagine that when you add this to a growing medium really what it's going to do is uh, promote aeration and that is the main absolutely the main uh, fundamental sort of purpose of perlite is for aeration in mixtures so if you're going to take peat or bark or orchid mix or 
whatever, even sand, uh, to, to really improve the drainage. Perlite is something that you really actually want to use. Uh, it is somewhat expensive, but it is really good. And when you go to a garden store and you see that they've actually added perlite or vermiculite um, and sand into your pots and you can, you can kind of pick them out, then you know that uh, obviously also depending on the type of plant that's being that's being planted then uh, you know that you're getting a product that has been well cared for or it's been well put together right okay so that is perlite so this one here is is really soft it's spongy it's delicious not to eat it's just like it's really really beautiful looking okay so vermiculite there's a little bit of contention here but apparently i have researched that in the 1990s somewhere word on the street is that they've removed asbestos from it because sometimes they they where they're found naturally they found close to asbestos deposits and so we all know that asbestos is super dangerous for uh humans to inhale uh I imagine for pretty much most mammals, actually, I speak under correction, but um, asbestos will give you asbestosis. Now, vermiculite is pretty safe. It, it really is very safe. This stuff, um, I would just say know your source. Like, know that there is no asbestos in it. Like, make sure that you uh, even contact your supplier to just find out about that, because a as you know, asbestosis asbestosis only affects you in later life for most people it doesn't actually you don't inhale it and then tomorrow you're sick uh, it's like you inhale it and then 10 years later you're wondering if it was all of the bad life decisions that you've made <laughs> and karma's coming to get you but no that's not it so it is a hydrous philosophate material um, and what that basically means is hydrous is basically absorbent, it's like water, it has to do with water, and then philosicate basically means uh, it's like phyllus, like, uh, like leaf shaped, like uh, they come in layers. And so if I take one, and now this is also uh, popped under heat, very high temperatures, and you can see the little leaf like structures, you see that? It's got like all these layers to it right um, and what's cool about it is it is also has a neutral pH yes ladies and gentlemen it's got a neutral pH so what does it get used for um, well number one it's non-toxic it is absolutely sterile which makes it really good for growing seeds it's absorbent so it holds water for longer whilst at the same time because the particles are so big it improves drainage so you have lots of drainage in this uh, a very very good product to use uh, makes hard composty soil uh, spongy so it adds a bit of like life to the soil you know allows improves air air movement in the soil uh, and perlite and vermiculite can basically be used uh, I won't say in interchangeably, but pretty much. If you really don't have one, you can use the other. Um, but they, they, are, they are fundamentally different. The one is to improve just aeration, right? It does have water holding capacity, but it doesn't hold on to its water as long as vermiculite does. Vermiculite is a water, water medium, so it will actually hold on. It's very spongy, holds on to water really well. Right, let's move on to the next two candidates I'm gonna do them together so that right there is called lecker right now this is basically a ball of clay which again has been put into a kiln at a temperature of 1900 degrees Celsius so and then what happens of course is the clay literally begins to expand and it forms little air bubbles. And how do you know that the air bubbles inside there? Well, if I took one of these pieces, which is basically crushed liquor, right? Uh, you can see the little air bubbles. Look, see all the little bubbles inside the clay. Right? That's good now. These little bubbles and beautiful exterior, smooth. 
but it is absorbent, which, which makes the stuff really excellent. Um, so essentially, you'll sometimes hear it being called clay, expanded clay aggregate, and that is what Lekka is. So, what is, what, what, what's the purpose? What's the use of, of, of Lekka? Well, again, same as vermiculite, it has a neutral pH, it is expanded clay, right? It is extremely durable because, I mean, over time, these two will break down. They'll they'll become, you know, gravity will will play its role as it does with us as well. As time goes by, we things sag, right, and they disappear. Um, in this case here, this is very durable. It's going to take a long time to get these things to break down. Uh, but at the same time, what's really cool about it is it is an absolutely natural substance. It's clay. Um, and so in terms of its uses horticulturally, you would actually use it for... You would actually use it for um, root development. Uh, you can also use it to increase humidity, so you will find in office buildings or, you know, when you're coming out of the elevator and you have the plant standing on the side, you'll usually find uh, a pot plant, like a palm tree or something, and you'll have clay balls in it, right? So that is lekker, because it makes the plant feel very lekker, and it makes the roots also feel very lekker. And lekker in South Africa is also a term that means absolutely rocking. It's just like I'm chilled, I'm lekker. Um, and so that is the purpose of lekker, right? There are some other uses as well. Uh, it obviously draws up water very slowly uh, and releases water to the atmosphere, so thereby sort of creating humidity. Uh, you can grow fern spores on it. Uh, you can grow tiny seeds on them, and yeah, it's just like it's endless, guys. Endless. I'm telling you, it's endless. Okay, let's move to the next one. Okay, let's go. Okay, so compost. Compost or potting soil, which is this stuff here. So let's just try and get you a close-up. This is basically composed of... Uh, in some cases, sand. People make it in different ways, but largely it is organic matter. So what is organic matter? It is basically uh, all of the leaves, all of the twigs, the branches, flowers, fruits, uh, stems, all of the parts of plants and fungus, f fungi and uh, just anything that was once living, even animals, that then break down and form part of the ecosystem. And if you do this in a controlled way, in a closed system, and you add heat and water to a lot of dead vegetative matter, it becomes compost. Um, compost generally should, a good compost should have different sizes of granules and things, um, and it should be well rotted. If it isn't, and it does get a lot of water, it will, or if it's, if it's way too well rotted, it actually becomes quite silty, and then you're going to end up with compaction, and that is the worst thing you can do to a plant, is if you put it into a growing medium where the soil begins to compact, that is, it will spell death for the plant. So generally this, I use as a base medium. Um, this is good, it adds nutrients, it you know, gives the plant something to feed off of, whilst the inorganic substances, for their, in their varying degrees, will actually allow you to, to amend a different medium, to, to, to create a medium that you, in which you can grow different types of, of plants. Okay, so that's what, that's what compost is. Now, I did mention potting soil and compost. The difference here is, it's not always different, but with good... Uh, good soil providers, if I could put it that way, uh, you would have a difference between potting soil and compost. Potting soil would generally have a little bit of this in it. Uh, is per light okay? Uh, well, would generally have a little bit of that in it, um, and that would actually just help the plant to remain and live in the pot. It would also have sometimes perlite or sand or you know some of those kinds of things, even lecker um, in very small quantities. But you would actually see it, would be noticeable. 
and what that does is it actually prevents that whole compaction and makes the the potting soil really good it holds water for for longer periods of time so the plant is living in an unnatural environment when it's in your home and therefore vermiculite is generally a very good thing to um, add to uh, potting soil or if you buy potting soil check that you do have a fair amount of vermiculite in it right next now this is one of my favorite growing mediums actually this is a non-renewable resource right obviously so is vermiculite perlite in fact so is all of them really some of them in greater quantities than other but others than but yeah so peat this is mold peat sphagnum peat this is not cocoa peat this is mold sphagnum peat so let's go through the uses for sphagnum peat right so peat comes in in south africa you'll find personally me nah, i find three different kinds of peat so two of which both have nutrients in it one is slightly less acidic the other one is slightly more acidic or in, in fact considerably acidic um, and the latter type of 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 peat which is the very acidic peat is really good for uh things like blueberries cranberries um those kinds of things and then also uh house plants potted plants uh, not as a not not solely as a medium like not on its own you need to actually obviously it's an additive so you mix it in and why do you mix it in because um it's also a very expensive medium so it is sadly it comes from bogs and things that get places that get dredged and and they harvest the stuff so when if i could just like conservatively implore you when you buy it don't waste it um, take care of the growing medium look after it uh, the same goes for all of them uh, sounds like something i should be saying at the end of the video but we're nearly there um, and the third kind of peat is absolute clean acid peat, which is its proper clean peat. No additives, no nutrients, no nothing, uh, just peat. And that stuff is amazing. I'm being surrounded by birds, like birds holding dragonflies in their beaks and sugar birds feeding off of the bromeliads. So I'm going to have to wrap this up. Yep. Yeah, okay, yeah, you. Yeah, she's really beautiful. It's kind of like uh, the American hummingbird, only it's the South African version, which is called a sugar bird. Okay, enough distraction. So yeah, that's the third peat, which is acid peat, right? Sorry, that's my GoPro. And that kind of peat gets used for conifers plants, uh, or plants that require an extremely acidic medium with no nutrients, like plants that grow in really poor soils, uh, that is what acid peat, the proper mold sphagnum peat gets used for. And then I did say three, but there is technically actually a fourth one, but I have covered that in another video. I'll put the, a link in the description. That is long fiber sphagnum. So that is the living version of this. that is the living version of this so once this dies away or once the living version dies away and gets covered by more strands above so it grows on top of one another up 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 um you basically end up with this stuff which is it gets compacted and you know it's in in those systems where they grow there's very little oxygen so that this organic matter doesn't decompose as quickly as others and therefore we actually get to harvest it so yeah that's that's peat um let's move to the second to last medium now this one here is uh it also comes in a variety of different forms um this is cocoa chip so this is basically the husk so you have palm peat and you have cocoa chip and the two come from sometimes their names are interchangeable but technically speaking palm peat comes from just a palm tree Cocoa peat comes from the actual coconut palm. So if I grab, let's see if I grab a piece. I did see one yesterday. Yeah, 
here, for example. So that would be, for example, uh, the shell, the outer shell, the or oh, not shell, Ooh, sorry. That would be the outer husk of a coconut, which has been shredded off and chipped up into little chips, which is what, which is why this is called cocoa chip. Okay, so cocoa chip, as you can see, obviously, if this stuff gets wet, it's going to become really absorbent. It is quite hard, but when it gets wet, it becomes really, really spongy, um, which is awesome stuff. Uh, and again, you don't want to use this for things like carnivorous plants. You can use it for orchids, bromeliads, epiphytes, anything that grows in a tree. You can also use it as part of making compost, uh, because when it breaks down, it forms really, really good stuff. Um, and it has aeration and great amount of water retention uh, you can imagine as obviously when it gets wet it really really like holds a lot of water and become we can become quite soggy if you want a wet uh, cocoa chip and also if you want to wet peat generally go with some lukewarm water because peat can absorb 10 times its weight in water and it takes a really long time to get wet so at least 24 hours if you're going to leave it in standing in cold water um, and then this one here will will also repel water a little bit uh, but it will get wet and when it does it gets absolutely soaking so the same goes for both of these drainage not good for drainage becomes very soggy so how do you use it uh, like obviously it comes from coconuts and how it's prepared is because coconuts grow basically at the seaside they rinse it in salt water and therefore it absorbs quite a bit of salt so this this medium has got quite a bit of salt in it so if you have the option or you have really good medium supplies check that you get buffered cocoa chip which means the salts have been removed uh, otherwise you're gonna end up using it for something like a nepenthes and your nepenthes will choke as a result of all the salt uh, salt sensitive plants will not enjoy that um, you do get buffered uh, cocoa chip so try try going for that really ultimately this is uh, buffered cocoa chip but really ultimately um, it really just uh, does come down to plants that are really super sensitive to salts uh, especially long term and then uh, they will succumb to to the presence of the salts uh, it also draws salts out of the, the atmosphere if you're all in in the environment if you're living close to the ocean same thing with this guy Pete okay so let us go to the last growing medium which is bark so this here is basically the skin of the tree right so this is the outer layer of the tree which is called bark or in this case this is orchid mix because if i do dig in there somewhere there should be bits of perlite obviously my supply is not really a bit cheap on giving me perlite into the stuff but i do add my own so this stuff is is there's a a lot of contention about whether wood chips or or bark is better look they say that wood chips is better and essentially i suppose depending on your perspective and your your intention wood chips for the most part is really great uh, but i prefer wood chips because i grow bromeliads and bromeliads are not uh, Let's not get rude. Prometheans are not... They're not babies, basically. They can they can handle quite a bit. And so... Why I say this is because, look, certain plants... Let me just... Let me do this. Right, so certain plants are alleliopathic, right? Certain trees have got a, an ecological strategy they use in which they create alkaloids deposit the alkaloids into every part of their tissues so bark leaves stems twigs that sort of thing and eucalyptus is a prime example some of the acacias are also prime examples of of trees which are liliopathic and what that means is they actually poison the soil 
sounds a bit dramatic, and I probably am being a, a bit dramatic, but it is noticeable uh, with certain species. So, bark sometimes contains, uh, or they come from, from trees or plants which are leliopathic, um, and sometimes they contain those alkaloids. It also contains something called suberin, because look, if your skin has a waterproof coating, right? Like when you get wet, you don't get wet all the way to your liver. You get wet only on your skin and then your skin dries. So with trees, it's the same thing. They've got suberin to protect them from consistent downpours and rain and just being wet all the time when it does rain. So the suberin, when the, the tree sloughs its bark off and the bark falls to the floor, uh, suberin still persists for a while before it breaks down. Personally, I am a bark man. I love the bark. I do use wood chips. I use wood chips for pathways. And I'll also use wood chips in, in, in sort of under the trees in the garden. Wood chip is basically comes from the core of the tree. So the internal structure of the tree, which is basically lots of lignified cellulose, um, which is basically just like bones, if you think about it. And the, the bark is the outer skin of the tree and so the tree will get rid of that but with that comes certain chemicals and things like that but they do break down and in my mind since it's coming from the cambium layer and it's going out and sloughing off into the environment uh, you see all of the good humus being produced by trees and forests a lot of that is twigs bark and uh, leaves fruit and stuff like that so you get this beautiful thick black layer it's bark. How often does a tree die on its own, right? So you feel me? You with me? So that's 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 my opinion, and you're entitled to yours. Um, so so I do absolutely use both. I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. Um, I just think that their purposes are different, and so that's that. And so bark is genius guys so is wood chips and if you like this video please give us a thumbs up alternatively subscribe to the channel i'm nearly at 1000 subscribers and i'm really excited about it because then i will build studio and do lots of videos and it will be exciting and do giveaways yeah, and stuff like that. Anyways, guys, have a good one. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you in the next episode. Bye for now.